Hello, everybody. Hello. I'd like to uh, have you all take a minute. Wes is going to show some slides here. And just notice the images on the screen. As the museum's archivist, I can tell you a story about every single one. Um, they all have some context weaved into the history of this place, uh, and it is a paleontological site, um, and is friends of the Tar Pits, or as we like to call you, Pit Pals, you probably all have some context and knowledge of what we do here, too. But right now, I just want you all to relax your forehead, and unclench your jaw, and let your shoulders go, and just sink a little bit deeper into your chair, and take in these images. Whoa, I'm going to knock this over. Um, and let your imagination just carry you to wherever it's inspired to go, because that's why we're here tonight. So on behalf of the NHMLAC Family of Museums, artist Mark Dion, the Getty Foundation, the Tanya Bonnetaker Gallery, welcome to Fossilized and Realize, the Brea Tar Pits in Art and Popular Culture at the La Brea Tar Pits. Tonight's panel discussion is on the inspirational significance of the La Brea Tar Pits in the cultural consciousness and experience of Los Angeles. This event is part of LBTP times Pacific Standard Time, Mark Dion, an artist residency at the La Brea Tar Pits, funded by the Getty Foundation, is part of the Getty's Pacific Standard Time 2024, Art Times Science Times LA Initiative, a series of exhibitions, public programs, and publications that will explore connections between the visual arts and science from prehistoric times to the present and across different cultures worldwide. I am Yolanda Bustos, and I'll be your moderator tonight. I'm the museum archivist and research librarian at the Natural History Museum in the La Brea Tar Pits. I've been here for about five years, and in that time, I've really gotten to know everybody that works here and have been really inspired by their wonderful work and really inspired by the Tar Pits as a place. Tonight, we'll be joined by historian, author, and lecturer, Dr. Allison Lawrence, artist and recipient of LACMA's Art Plus Technology Lab Grant, Carl Chang, an artist and our artist in residence uh, for our Pacific Standard Time grant, Mark Dion. Okay, momentarily, I'm gonna turn over the floor to these guys to talk about themselves and they'll tell you a little bit more about their work. Then we'll jump right into the conversation and we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. And with that said, take it away, Allison. All right, hello, I'm Allison Lawrence. Uh, I am a cultural historian of the modern United States, uh, but I write mostly about extinct animals. Um, and that can sound like a contradiction, but it's not, right? I try to understand through my research and my writing how we pull things that lived and died long before the construction of the societies that we live in now came to be, how we pull those into our histories, right? And turn them into cultural heritage and part of um, uh, the world that we live in today, right? We're surrounded by extinct animals, especially dinosaurs. And most of my research has to do with dinosaurs, but I find myself pulled back again and again and again to the tar pits to think with this space, right? Even though there are no dinosaurs here, I, I keep finding myself interested in uh, the lost lives of the, the furry little creatures um, that, that got stuck here. So I think we're going to come to my slide in a moment. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right, yes, okay. So a recent victim of the tar pits. Now I want you to think for a moment. Have a guess. You don't have to shout it out, but when do you think this was recent, right? When, when did this jackrabbit fall prey to the tar pits? Do you have a year in mind? Now the, <laughs> the LA Public Library doesn't actually have a date on this uh, archival photograph, um, but likely it was snapped between 1913 and 1915 uh, during the museum's excavations, right? Uh, when uh, uh, there were a lot more things in which the creatures who were 
hanging out in Los Angeles could get trapped, right? The, the fact that we are digging here and we are exploring and excavating and turning this into a place um, that is irrigated and has fragrant trees brings a lot of creatures to the space that otherwise might not actually be attracted here, right? So we're bringing them to their doom occasionally. Um, but if you'll imagine, just for a moment, that this was not a photograph, right? This was just a view onto a scene, right? This, this could be happening right now. It could be happening 100 years ago. It could be happening 15,000 years ago, right? This jackrabbit uh, is an individual, but its species has been around for a long time, and it has lived and died and been fossilized at La Brea for many thousands of years. Um, so this is one of the things that I think is really fascinating about the tar pits as a historian, the way in which uh, we focus as museum visitors and as human beings who love drama, uh, we focus on the extinct things, the uh, dramatic entrapment scenarios, when often it's more mundane and it's, uh, you know, less less tragic uh, with all due respect to this jackrabbit, right? This is not an extinction event, right? And so one of the things I like to explore is how um, we start to focus on La Brea as an ex a space of extinction when, when that's not what the tar pits are, right? It's a continuum between deep time and now. And that's something that I really try to explore in my work. So Wes, if you could hop to my final slide. Thank you. So I love it when the museum plays with this, right? So this is on pit 13, I believe, which if you head uh, west toward LACMA and north toward 6th, you'll find this signage. And it, it warns you to tread lightly, right? And it's playful, but slightly serious, right? The tar could take you down too. We are part of our environment here. Um, and I think the Tar Pits uh, does this well and has the opportunity to reach even more audiences and show how humans are part of an environment. We are not exceptional in this space. So I'm going to pass it to Carl now to talk about the tar itself. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> um. Uh, my name is Carl Chang. I'm a local local artist. Um, I have a primary interest in phenomena in arts. I'm a sculptor that does public art. So um, I've had a, something, since I'm from here, I grew up with the La Brea Tar Pits, and from grammar school on, I've been interested. And when I go to the... Um, County Museum of Art, and I always take a stroll through the park itself and see the tar. So for me, the connection between the art and the tar pits is something closely related, and I don't separate it so much as two institutions. But um, one of the things I've always questioned about the art uh, LACMA is that um, there's no connection between the art museum and the site of the tar. So that was what, something that always puzzled me that there's not one acknowledgement from the art museum about tar itself in the site, so the uniqueness of it. Um, so what I did was um, lots of times I would walk through the park and um, I also noticed that, um, let's go to the next, this is sort of the original sludge that was La Brea tar pits when the in 1890s, and so the park itself has completely been designed a number of times to make it look like what it is today, but it actually was just a gigantic sludge pit of tar that just started somewhere in uh, near Griffith Park, and it was a sludge thing that came down. Uh, in those days, they mined all the oil out of it and left it like that, so... <clears throat> In walking through the park, one of the things I've always noticed, and I'm sure you've seen it too, is these little, um, the bubbles that come out of the seeps. This is um, methane gas, it, it dissolves the bubble a little bit, so it just comes up here and there. So that's what started me in being interested in working with tar. It's as a substance, as an artist, I was interested in the substance of it and what the phenomena of it was, how it was made. Um, 
Tar, as we know, is the residue of all organic life. That means everything, including ourselves. So it's quite primal in our time today because we're through carbon, which is what tar is made out of, we're, we're on the verge of destroying the whole planet. So the importance of it is, seems to be coming up more and more. I mean, 30 years ago, I didn't think that way, but now we see what's the results. But anyway, that gave me a very strong interest to try to do something with it. So along with walking through the park, I also noticed that there were a lot of excavated tar pits that are now empty and they were fenced in and nothing was happening to them. So <clears throat> in 1990, I got a small grant from the city of Los Angeles to investigate whether art could be put into those excavated tar pits. And that started me in a, um, working on more and more into the whole realm of the La Brea tar pits. I went to the Page Museum and met the founder, George Page, and introduced the idea of <coughs> doing some artwork in those unused uh, fenced-in tar pits. And he supported the idea right away and um, thought it was, it was kind of a no-brainer to do something in those pits since they're all, there's about six of them, I believe, that there's nothing in them. So um, with that, <clears throat> I, um, through this grant, I started thinking about tar pools. Um, I had worked with the Exploratorium in San Francisco and made, I worked with bubbles in water and made some uh, ring bubbles and other things. And I also worked in the lagoon at the Exploratorium at the time. So I was familiar with some of the technology of how bubbles could be made. So I made a small tank there, as you see on the bottom, that tried to experiment a little bit with how to make tar uh, bubbles. And the idea was that I would make these huge tar bubbles that would uh. gradually come out and, and the viscosity and thickness of the tar would make this thing kind of slow it down so people could see. So that was one idea that I had relating to tar itself. Um, so um, in 1990, I received, um, that was the grant for the first part of it. And then in 1990, I, or 2014, I raised $20,000 through US Artists Incorporated and used the money to do something in my studio. I, I, um, got a 150-gallon tank, filled it with tar, and put pipes in it and other technical devices and used compressed air, trying to make up and discover some of the, the phenomena of what tar is like. It's, um, as we know, it's thick and toxic and lots of bad things, but it's very shiny and beautiful in its own way, so that attracted me even more. Um, so I built these tanks and played around with ideas relating to it. Um, I also came up with ideas of making some tar pools and tar pits and also pots that would use the compressed air technology to make things happen like if it would be a fountain that would, had something to do with tar instead of water. Um, I came up with some other tar pit designs and pools as well. Um, then um, in 2016, uh, I received a art and technology grant from LACMA and I used the money to further research on this, the tar pits. So what I did was made a model of a, a pool of tar that could be put into the sites that are the excavated pits and put a something like a greenhouse or something that would protect the tar from somebody falling in or becoming a bone thing or something. But anyway, that was also to make the tar in a pure, playing with the tar in a very pure sense 
Um, and as you see tar that's out there now, it's full of leaves and debris, so you don't really get a chance to see exactly how tar is. So with that, I um, made this video. So, is that running now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so there you, you see a, a making a sort of a, a pool of a metal container that would hold the tar. And instead of bubbles coming up, I would make things come out of the tar. And would, um, let's see what happens. So here's a, a YouTube video from LACMA. I cut it down. <coughs> I shortened it so that it's a, so out of the tar would be something like this coming out. So it's a basically a pl plate of metal with a hole in, in, in the middle of it. The idea here is that a person could walk up to the greenhouse and look in and see the phenomena of what happens when a plate like this does come out of a tar pit. So it, it does a very um, it's in slow motion. <laughs> I want you all to know that I watched all 16 minutes of this. It's totally hypnotic, and I definitely <laughs> recommend you do it. Well, for this thing, um, so I had we cut out 10 minutes of it for you. So at some point, the tar and then the oculus oh, inside opens amazing. up. If you're having a bad day. Just calms you right down. Yeah, this project will slow you down, definitely. <laughs> and then as it goes back inside, the, that's another f four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so where we are, where we're at today is that. Um, LACMA is interested in doing this project and raising money and um, we're also trying to work with the Natural History Museum to, to, for the site and make it integrated in terms of art and science and history. So that's the project. Okay, so I, I'm here to confess my love affair with the La Brea Tar Pits <laughs> Museum. And, you know, I am, um, I'm a fan, right? And my fandom starts uh, probably in, in about 1968 when I checked this book out of the Bookmobile in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. And uh, as, as a, a young person interested in prehistory and prehistoric life, you know, I was, I, um, the bookmobile was my, my, uh, my great access to the world of the past. And I, I took out all of the books on dinosaurs. And then, of course, this book by, uh, you know, by Roy Chapman Andrews, the famous paleontologist who was later the director of the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, and what's not to love? I mean, mm -hmm. giant, ferocious beasts being smothered and killed in tar. I mean, it's a fantastic story. Um, and so the tar pits really ingrained itself in my consciousness and my subconscious, probably. Uh, uh, you know, and, and of course, I was a big fan of paleo art. I always imagined I would be a paleo artist, and in some way I am, but not in the way I thought. So I even went to um, the Hartford Art School so I could study with Rudolf Zallinger, who was a famous paleo artist who painted the, the murals at the uh, Peabody Museum. And, and uh, somehow I was introduced to contemporary art through people like Dan Graham and Vito Acconci and Jack Goldstein, and that derailed my paleo art career. 
until I could re re resuscitate it in a very different form. So, uh, just to just to bring it home, this is a model kit that I had as a young boy, uh, which depicts the tar pit. Uh, as far as I know, I'm a, I'm a little um, disappointed at the paleontologists here because they have not found the woolly rhino that is depicted in this. But but you know. I hope it'll show up any moment now. Uh, so this, this is what it looks like unpainted, and this is the painted version of this uh, incredible model. So, um, you know, and that's pretty much what I expected uh, when I came out here. And so, uh, you know, my, my interest in the, in the tar pits really uh, cont was, was lifelong. And, and so um, in uh, 19, I think 1985 or so, my uh, best friend and I, Bob Brain, we did a road trip in his uh, 64 Buick Special from New York to Vancouver because we thought we wanted to go to the World's Fair in Vancouver. And we got in line to buy tickets and we looked at each other and we're like, this seems like really corny, right? <laughs> and said, yeah, well, what do you want to do instead? Let's go to the La Brea Tar Pits. So we drove from Vancouver, this is us in our, <laughs> on our road trip. So we drove here to encounter the La Brea Tar Pits and I have to say, I wasn't disappointed, not a bit, right? So, and I love this museum. I have never been to Los Angeles without coming to this museum. And uh, so, you know, I've been here a lot. I take, um, I know this is gonna be excruciating for some people to hear, I take great pleasure in the fact that some aspects of it have not changed, you know, <laughs> uh, which I think museum fans often feel that way. And, uh, you know, and I think, I um, mean, like, like Carl, the, the sort of symbolic value of tar and its, and our, and its, uh, um, its mirroring in our, our incredibly destructive petroleum culture was something I, I honed in on very well. I like the idea of working with tar and I've worked on it with it a lot in my work. And I thought, you know, it's interesting to have a relationship to a material um, uh, and, and see these kind of properties. And I, I see tar as this kind of incredible, and, and in a way that tar also is standing in for uh, petroleum culture as this incredible material which signifies uh, smothering and, uh, and extinction and death, right? So in a way, I was thinking about how Joseph Boyce used fat, you know, lard and fat as this positive symbol of, of the spreading of energy, the energy held and then released. And I thought, well, like, Asphalt is kind of the opposite of that, right? It smothers, it kills. So maybe this, this might be one of the first works in which I've used tar. So I have a wonderful plush bear uh, who is holding a Sony boombox, which, uh, which is playing recordings that I made in, uh, in, uh, Central in the jungle in Central America. And she is sitting in this tub of tar and the tar is slowly seeping up her um, fabric carcass. And she sits on a uh, shipping crate. So also trying to acknowledge that these objects that I make have, you know, circulate in the world. They are not innocent from, uh, from the very culture that they're trying to critique. And I did many versions of this. Also, you know, th this is, you know, like I said, this is an early work. This is maybe 1992. So, you know, I'm thinking a lot about the issues that, that come up later, issues of uh, you know, how places that we've always thought of as, as terrifying, as things that, that uh, brave men would have to challenge their courage to confront, are now things we think about as, as quite fragile, right? The Arctic and, and the Amazon, we don't imagine them as, as, uh, as terrifying places that uh, people test their courage against. We think about them as, as endangered, as things that need to be protected. So, the, po the, the polar bear took a number of different incarnations from the sublime to the ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I wanted to make my own tar pits museum. So this is the tar museum. This is a, in an exhibition I did in, uh, in Vienna. And it's, uh, so you can see it has a, an old world look to it, uh, perhaps more than the George Page Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it is surrounded by a number of sculptures which are also uh, representing uh, organisms imb embedded in tar. They're, they're sort of sculptures. Um, and very often, yeah, so they are representing a very basic aspects of animalness. A lot of these are um, 
uh, are blanks for taxidermy forms that, I, uh, that I'm using, or sometimes decoys. It's, it's sort of important. This is actually a cave bear skeleton embedded in tar, and then um, in the, in the, uh, the, there are a few objects, a kind of broken teacup and a spoon and a, a number of other things as well, sort of signs, uh, sort of um, uh, anthropomorphic elements, I would say. A lot of the works I've recently done uh, with tar often have the tars embedded with, uh, with sort of trifles, with, with costume jewelry and, and things like dominoes and, and, um, uh, and dice and, uh, and jacks and sort of these kinds of uh, things that in some way represent the, the, the trifles that we're sort of trading off uh, in uh, the world for. So as the artist in residence, you can imagine that um, I'm delighted to be here. I mean, this is, this is a, a boyhood dream perhaps come true. And the fact that I spend my days surrounded by incredibly intelligent, generous, kind people as, uh, as I'm learning every day what this place is and what it means. So it's, you know, this is an extraordinary opportunity for me. I think that's it. You've brought up a lot of great points. Um, so we'll just jump into some questions. Uh, as Angelinos, we live with a disaster amnesia, while at the same time contending with some really real threats of earthquakes and fire and all sorts of other nat natural disaster while we're living on top of this kind of graveyard of animal entrapments. So you could say that Los Angeles is a city built upon anxiety and that we really thrive on it. Um, the tar pits are always presented as a site of like terrific catastrophe in pop culture. And in our real world present day, um, Allison, you've written about the, the playful warnings of uh, the tar pits, you know, it can suck you in. Um, how do you all see the anxiety of what's happened beneath us contributing to the allure of the tar pits? And, how do you see that really coming through in your work? Want to take it, Mark? I see you making eye contact. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just seeing if Carl was going to make eye contact. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm, you know, I mean, I, I think that that's one of the uh, attraction. You know, Thanatos is a very powerful force, right? And, and we are definitely attracted to that. And in the, in the same way that... Um, that very young people are interested in these, in dinosaurs, for instance, in, in ferocious uh, things of terrifying scale, which actually aren't around anymore, thank for that. So <laughs> thank goodness. I think that that's also an aspect here, that, that you have these um, organisms that are on this ter terrifying scale, but at the same time, they're not here, but you have the tar, which is also uh, terrifying and, and, and life extinguishing. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, I think it is very magnetic um, and, and our um, sort of pleasure in this is, is in some way, I, I think, very much a kind of morbid fascination, right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's easier to address the rupture, right, the chasm, the, the dramatic effect than to face the sort of slow death, right? The, you know, what oil culture is, is yeah. doing to our world, right? So it's easier to turn our attention to these distinct events, right? Um, these things that we can say are, are disasters or tragedies rather than, um, you know, wrap our heads around what these, these wicked problems uh, <laughs> um, that are, are more difficult to address, right? Yeah, and I think that it'll be interesting when this museum also builds into it um, a, a, a sort of a moment where we're saying goodbye to mm -hmm. petroleum culture, right? That, mm -hmm. that petroleum culture is also coming to an end one way or another. Uh, and, and the museum can easily have an interesting role in relationship to presenting that transition story, right? I think one of the things that uh, I question the most is how did the human being we use, the, use this residue of all organic life 
and how come we use it in such an extensive manner? Um, if we think about that we eat the tar in some ways in drugs and, and pharmaceuticals, we dress ourselves in plastics, we eat the stuff, we live with it, our cars are driven by it, the asphalt that we drive on is, the roads are made out of it, um, um, then even we worship it in a form of diamonds. I mean, diamonds is nothing but carbon pressed to a point where it turns into what it is. That means we, we have a priceless worship to that. How did we get as human beings the top of the nature's food chain? How did we get to the point where we use it so much in the form of carbon, carbon dioxide, that we're actually destroying ourselves? How did we ever get to this point where why organic substance? You know, it's just tar represents that. And that's a question that I don't see how. I mean, since the caveman, they put, you know, pitch and, you know, sealed canoes or did other things up till now where we refine it to the degree we do and we use all the solvents and gasoline, uh, you name it, we use it. How come we got to that stage? How come we're destroying ourselves with it? And we're part of it. I mean, we're, we're like, um, we're made out of carbon ourselves, 12%, I believe. But how did we get to this stage? I mean, I haven't got any answers, but <laughs> I only have questions. A lot of anxiety. Um, on, a, on a lighter note. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's not going to be hard to find a lighter note. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're all stressed out now. You're like, why are we using <laughs> um, So we have this interactive exhibit here. It's just around the corner there, and it's called Tar is Sticky. And if you've never tried it, I, I really recommend that you do it before you leave tonight. It's a series of weights that have been submerged into the tar. So you get this visceral sensation of entrapment. And in the archives, there's a newspaper story about some young boys who were playing by the tar pits in the 50s, and they ended up getting entrapped themselves, and they had to be rescued by the fire department. They were OK, everybody, but it was just like a dramatic event. Um, and then we've worked with artists like Gary Baseman, who've come over and, and baptized one of his creatures in the tar pits. Um, and James Griffith, who paints with the tar. And I know at least one personal story of somebody who, like, in a fit of rage, threw their phone into the tar pits. Ooh. So, Carl, can, uh, your project proposes continually submerging and raising that plate in the tar. And my question is, what is it about the tar that makes everyone want to dip stuff in it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't answer that question straight off, but... Uh... I mean, I'm curious, is what else is besides the dinosaur, or not the dinosaurs, but the bones? I mean, how many people flipped in there, and, you know, is there an automobile in there somewhere, you know, and parts of this and pieces of that, you know? I wonder if in digging it up, all these bones, what do you find that's weirdo? You know, whoever, people throwing their guns in there or something, you know? What have we done in there? So that's a question of, you know, what's in there, what is let there? alone falling in there. But, I think uh, people think it's a lot deeper than it is, mm -hmm. too. Or that, like, it'll be a really quick sink. <laughs> Mark, do you have any thoughts? It is enormously pleasurable to, <laughs> to, you know, try to move that tar. And today I was in um, Pit 91, and uh, just, you know, they're taking... Um, trowels full and putting it into a bucket and just the way it moves. I think Carl captures that in, in the video very and in the piece very well. The the way it moves, it just has this this other time, which is very different from liquids we're used to, right? It's it's seeping, it's moving like all the other liquids. It's just moving at a much slower and really satisfying pace. It's, it's like, you know, to go back to the International House of Pancakes, you know, there is something great about dripping that syrup on the pancakes, and tar has that quality, yeah. I think Carl used the word primal earlier when he was speaking. I, I think there's something to that, right? Um, the, the tar and also the extinct animals 
trigger something in us, right? That's primal, but also nostalgic. So it takes us back at the same time to, you know, a place that, that we never experienced, but it also takes us back to our childhood. Right, um, so it's this sort of double, uh, double move that's happening. And this morning, I was speaking to a curator uh, at the Smithsonian, and, and she's, she's like, "Oh, you're, you're going to the tar pits tonight? Let me tell you, uh, a few years back, I had a meeting at LACMA. I ditched it, and I just sat and." <laughs> poked a stick in a, in a tarp pool for 30 minutes, right? Because there was just something that called to her. Um, so I, I think there's something to it. It just brings us back to, to another time, and that's another time in our life and another time that, that we could never actually experience in our life. Again, I do recommend watching the whole video of Carl's <laughs> <laughs> dipping into the tar. He will be completely transfixed. Um, so Mark, Mark wrote that the job of the artist is to go against the grain of dominant culture, to challenge perception and convention. Um, Allison, can you talk about moments of conflict wherein your ideas about the tar pits were challenged or changed by the reality mm -hmm. of what the tar pits really are as a place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not an Angelino. So the first time I experienced the tar pits was in a, you know, a sixth grade um, earth sciences textbook. It's a, I just remember the picture of the saber tooth. And so when I first visited in 2016 and I came over from Echo Park and got off a bus, I was like, what is this, right? I was shocked. It's literally in the middle of the city, right? Um, so I think I, I had sort of created this sort of primitive fantasy in my mind. And what I found was something so much more interesting, right? Because this is a space that has to wrestle not only with how to represent, you know, past worlds, but also how to negotiate with the other people who use this place, right? The people who want to walk their dogs or ride their bikes. It's a public park. And the people who live here have the right to use it as, as they wish. And so this tension just sort of surprised me. And my favorite thing, Yolanda, in the archives is to read through the incident reports. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> um, we've got, in the 60s, Victor Zanoni is, is like writing all these angry memos. Like, the hippies just won't. Like, oh, these hippies, right? Um, the loud music they play, or the kids climbing on uh, the statues that were um, left over from the Depression era. And in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they started to sort of crack, and the, um, the nails were rusty. So these kids climbing on them would get injured and, and uh, potentially get tetanus. Um, so, you know, I think I was so, I wasn't expecting that. Like, this is a really unique uh, relationship between a museum and the public, and, and I think that's why I keep coming back to it as a research question. Sure. Anybody else have anything? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I just feel like a fan, you know? I mean, I, I, that's what this is about, right? Yeah. We're all just fanning out right now. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I mean, I think the story here is so interesting and so hard to tell in a way. And, you know, I mean, as, as I'm reminded by, um, by your colleagues here every day, this is, this is the most complete fossil bed in the world, right? It's, it's, it's a snapshot of what the world looked like, you know, 50,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, and no one else has that. You know, that it has all the elements from the pollen to the leaves to the plants to the insects to the vertebrates and the invertebrates, it's all here, and there's no other spot on Earth like this that is being examined in the same way. So, you know, what's really interesting to me is, is just, like, how important this place is and the stories that can be told through this, and, you know, and, and it comes down and this, it comes back in this really perverse way to the, the story of climate change and extinction. So it, there's no more vital story than that. So I think that's... That's really the fulcrum of this place, right? That's what's that's the that's the amazing thing. I, th I think there's those um, being from here. When I um, got that small grant from the city and talked to um, George Page, uh, one of his curators, his name was Richard something. He retired, but he was a guy that been here for. I think he'd been here for 30, 40 years. And he knew everything about the park itself and how, the, as a curator on the ground, 
how to keep this place going. And there was a lot of stories he told me that were completely, you know, in, in terms of how people can relate to this area because as we saw in the original pictures, it was just a sludge pit and uh, how they made it into a park with paving in it and, and lawns and everything like that. Um, through the years, it completely, constantly, the chaos of tar itself and the seeps coming up, they didn't obey anything. They come up in the parking lot, in the sidewalks. And so uh, this curator was showing me and walking around, I went around with him and he's showing me how, oh, oh here's a, some tar coming out of the grass. So how do they mitigate that from somebody walking into it and getting smeared? So there'd be the traffic cones on it. And then if it got serious, they'd build a little fence around it. And there was a whole vocabulary of trying to maintain the place so that people could actually come here. And people would get tar on their feet and rub it and they get it on their hands and then they'd rub it on the trees. And then he showed me you know, all these trees that were dying because they were full of tar. But just trying to make, make it um, usable was something that was completely like a, trying to take care of chaos. You know, basically that's how he was dealing with it. But let's see what happens next, you know, with the new design and everybody wants to fantasize about the tar and meanwhile it's just coming up everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's actually coming up in people's homes on the other side of Wilshire. I mean, there's some people have to pump that out and these are all the things that, you know, he was telling me and it's like, it just boggled my mind at how much just to be able to come here and see this place and what it takes, you know. <clears throat> Okay, I think this is our last question, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. So this is for everybody. Do you feel your processes of making are more akin to an excavator, extracting or exposing ideas, or like sediment, layering ideas and leaving them to be discovered by a viewer? We'll start with Mark. Well, that's a really hard question to start with. <laughs> um, I don't ask easy questions. Yeah, I, I think... I think it depends on the project. I think you can use both methodologies, right? And so I do a lot of work that is about collecting and, and recontextualizing. And so taking things from one place. I, I just did this project in, um, in South Korea where I was cleaning beaches and taking plastic garbage from the, from the South Sea and then the West Sea and then putting that into a beautifully made double-sided cabinet. And so this is beach garbage. It's really nasty stuff. But at the same time, these objects are made, you know, they're made to attract us. They are made, there's, an, there's armies of colorists and, and product designers who make these, um, you know, uh, laundry bottles and, 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 uh, and soda bottles, just beautiful. So we desire them. And even after this time where the sand and the sun is, has, and the ocean has work, worked on them, they still have that, so that's that's sort of something where I feel very much like I am excavating this and putting it in a new context and, and telling a different story. Uh, and I, I would say that's probably more primarily my methodology than, than layering things. In a way, I always think that layering things creates a kind of hierarchy, and I'm, I'm always trying to blur hierarchies and, and taxonomies. And, I think one of one of um, one of the reasons we're in a lot of trouble is through of the artificial taxonomies that that um, that we use in in a sense that 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 um, that we mistake for having some social function which which they don't right and so uh, so I would say yeah maybe maybe I'm less sedimentary and more <laughs> excavator. Uh, excavator we've got an excavator yeah. everybody yes. Yes. <laughs> how about you Carol. I, I think I'd be more excavator because <laughs> I'm trying to discover. Or, but then when I think about it, most of the things I think about go back to my childhood. So then it's layered. So it's sort of in between there. Confused. <laughs> it's a relationship. Yeah. 
So, oh, I'm absolutely an excavator, right? I'm a historian, so I'm dependent yeah. on the archive. <laughs> I'm dependent on what exists and what Yolanda is like, you know, making <laughs> available to me and organizing beautifully, right? Um, but, you know, we know that archives are not actual snapshots of the past in the same way that the tar pits and the fossils here are not, a, you know, perfect um, image of what was here before, right? It might be the most complete uh, fossil locale in the world, but it's also fragmentary, right? It's, uh, we overrepresent represent uh, carnivores here, right? Just because of the nature of the entrapments. Um, so we know that the tar pits and the archive is not a, a true reflection of, of the world. And so like Mark, I think there's a lot of contextualizing to do even when you're chipping away to reveal uh, the, the statue within, right? You gotta, you gotta put a label on it. <laughs> These were all excellent answers. We have three excavators. Do we have any uh, complimentary travel for our guests tonight, maybe? <laughs> Do we have questions from our audience? Joel will. If anyone has any questions, just raise your hand and I will walk you. We've got one in the back here. We don't have a mic with you. Uh, for Mark Dion, you said that when you were younger, you wanted to become a paleo artist. I was simply curious as to were there any extinct animals or specific kind of uh, fossil formations that you would like to work on in terms of paleo art or representation? Thank you. I'm really interested in the police you've seen at the moment. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm here, and this, so this is, this is the, the, this is the moment. This snapshot in time is, is what I'm most interested in, and, and you know, I am the artist in residence who's trying. I am, I'm trying to excavate a project here. I'm, I'm looking very hard. There's so much here uh, to work on. There's so many different approaches, and so much. You know, one of the things that makes it really hard for me to come up with a project here is that the museum is so darn good. Right? I mean, there's so much that the museum is doing that's really interesting. There's so many stories the museum's telling that they tell well. And um, so, um, you know, I'm trying to figure that, I'm, I'm sort of trying to figure that out. But, but definitely, um, you know, the more I find out about what happened here 20, 30,000 years ago, the more, the more focused I am on, on, on this, this moment. Right here. Hi. A technical question for the artist regarding tars and art mediums. Uh, does it ever dry? Uh, would we have to get it from somewhere else or could we get it from here if we wanted to use it? In a room where there is art made with it, would it smell? Would it be toxic? Could it be thin to use as a paint? People do use it as paint. Yeah. I, can, I can answer some of that. Um, I've looked into how to make a tar pool, for instance, that doesn't evaporate the gases from the tar, doesn't uh, evaporate, and that had to do with um, talking to a chemist and um, putting a layer of some other oil on top of it. There's parts of, let's say, the, the where you see the tar pool that has what looks like water on top of it, and the tar itself is dried up actually down below the seeps come up and then the gases come up, but they're actually where, where they have the uh, sculptures of the Macedons and stuff there, it's actually water. So it doesn't, um, um, the water uh, puts a layer of something over the tar, but the tar is actually dried up sort of. So tar does dry up. So in making the tar pool, I was looking into putting another type of oil on top of it so that the tar would not be able to evaporate in terms of the gases. So and, and tar does like change obviously viscosity with temperature too. So there's some interesting things about that. Yeah. But you know, this is a super art friendly institution, so I'm sure <laughs> there is a protocol for artists and people to get um, asphalt from here. So I'm I'm sure if you talk to the right people, there, there are definitely ways, there, you know, there's paperwork and stuff, but it definitely, you can, you can get tar from here. And then a quick question regarding that, would you have to filter it, clean it, or anything, or have you in your works? Well, they have pure tar here, 
that's in five gallon. It used, I mean, um, in 30 years, a lot of things have changed here. And in, in the beginning, they used to sell the 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 pure tar. It was, and they they had it in five gallon um, buckets, and people could buy it. Uh, or I, I also know artists that came and they just gave it to them, including me. I got a few buckets of it. So there's been a lot of artists that are interested in using it in paint or some way. And in the past, the History Museum has allowed people to take it if they had a good reason for it. And so they, and they also um, excavate tar. In the past, they would pump the tar out so they could get at the fossils. So then the, the company that pumps it out would sell it somewhere. So there is some kind of a m ongoing mechanism of how they use and get rid of the tar and whether it's available or not. It, it can smell really bad too. But, yeah, and, 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 it and, and smells being, plenty really bad. Not, bad. not good for you as well. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> too, yeah. I feel like he's been inspired though. Which is <laughs> the point of this conversation. I think we have time for one more question. I just wanted to make you aware that there's a popular Irish folk song called Hot Asphalt <laughs> that relates to uh, the humorously to labor conditions in building roads. And it has a lot to do with the material. How about the material that we use? That would be interesting. Very cool. Sometimes, Sometimes, you find it on yeah. Sometimes it seeps up and stops traffic. Like, wasn't it just a few years ago where we couldn't drive down Wilshire because it was there was like a random seep one day? Pretty wild. Wild stuff. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Can we get a round of applause for our presenters?